Hi, I'm Alex Becker, and I'm one of the multimedia editors here at the Dartmouth. I'm here today with Steve Cole, a uh, journalist and author whose extensive experience makes doing a short introduction very difficult. Uh, Steve is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, most recently for his 2004 book, Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA, Afghanistan, and Bin Laden from the Soviet Invasion to September 10th, 2001. Uh, he's worked as a reporter and a managing editor at the Washington Post and as a writer at The New Yorker. And Steve currently uh, serves as dean of the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. Steve, thank you for joining me. Glad to be here. So I want to start off uh, talking about Ghost Wars, or rather the, the sequel to Ghost Wars uh, that you're working on. He said uh, in an email to the Huffington Post that you'd initially resisted uh, doing a second volume that would essentially cover from 9-11 um, onwards because you weren't sure where the ending to that story uh, would be. And now that the U.S. has set its uh, withdrawal date in 2014, you see how the, the narrative and the structure might work there. Uh, from a journalist's perspective on the story of the United States and, and al-Qaeda, the United States and uh, violent extremism, does 2014 represent sort of a, a pivotal shift in that story, or is the story kind of simply moved to other areas, Somalia, North Africa, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. The the what we call Al-Qaeda, which is lots of different things, an organization and a kind of network of like-minded groups and and a kind of a movement, at least an aspiration to be a movement. It's also just a name, a brand. So all of that narrative um, has become much more fragmented and dispersed, and uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan are less relevant to where what you might call Al-Qaeda is today. But as to ghost wars, um, while the original narrative from 1979 to 2001 treated the rise of al-Qaeda as an important threat, and the purpose of the book was to try to provide a backstory to where 9-11 had come from, and so al-Qaeda carried out 9-11, so that was certainly a motivation of that volume. But it was also much more largely a, about the triangle between the United States, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, and particularly covert action programs and intelligence relationships that had grown up starting with the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and how the kind of underground war you know had produced these un unintended consequences uh, including al-Qaeda and 9-11 and so and, the, and that volume also had sort of mini histories of some of the intelligence institutions CIA inter-services intelligence ISI in Pakistan which has been a very influential institution in that country and in the region. And so the second volume really is uh, the idea that I have in my mind, given that we went to war in Afghanistan, that we have been there since 2001, or just winding down our direct involvement in Afghanistan, that we've had this struggle in our relationship with Pakistan, symbolized by the fact that Osama bin Laden was hiding there, and we had to go in without Pakistani help and kill him, um, to frame this second volume very much around that triangle and around the same ideas that were in the first volume. I think one of the hard things as a, you know, as the author of a sequel for the first time is for me to just come to terms with the fact that there are a lot of readers of the first volume who might pick up the second volume and what they want is a continuation of the story they left off. It's like in a very minor way, you know, if you're like writing Harry Potter book, you can't change the characters in the second you have to kind of, you have to deliver on, on something that really is a sequel. And so, in a, a broader sense, U.S. media has been covering this broad set of narratives and, and relationships that are America's conflict with Al-Qaeda and, and the groups it spawned and, you know, its ideology in general. Um, we've been doing this for the last 12 years in a very intense way, and obviously there were those covering it before, but what do you see as the kind of most crucial storyline um, and, and kind of most crucial storylines and topics of investigation uh, in this relationship moving forwards? And if you're uh, sort of talking to journalists today, what, what over the next five years would you really like to what see? What do you people? want to cover? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's the sort of, there's the story abroad and then there's the story at home and they've always been related, but um, I, I guess um, I would think about them in the way you asked, uh, as maybe distinct categories. So abroad, um, chronicling the fragmentation and the, and the uh, revival of jihadist extremist groups with 
international ambitions um, is going to be a running story, an element of uh, covering political violence in the world for an indefinite time. Right now the story is in Syria, it's in Somalia, it's in North Africa, it'll keep moving around. Uh, but it's a very difficult story for Western journalists to cover because the subjects are quite hostile and, uh, and unlike Osama bin Laden in his 1990s heyday, uh, the new jihadists are not as uh, media savvy and they're not as well organized, they're more fragmented, they're more criminalized. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult uh, story, but an important one as part of coverage of these regional theaters, where of course there's lots more going on than just jihadist extremism. And uh, at home, I think there are an important set of questions for journalists that um, involve the sustainability of the national security state and, and laws and bureaucracies and practices that were built up after September 11th and, and the attempt to essentially find a, if, if not a, a kind of a peacetime footing, a more sustainable a form of national defense um, that is um, less expensive, less intrusive, and uh, less and involves less departures from American constitutional traditions than we have tolerated over these last 10 or 12 years. And, and that, that is a very important subject. Uh, you could say that the Snowden leaks and such are an element of such journalism, although that's kind of an unconventional form of journalism. But that subject matter, of, and it's a very politicized subject, so it's very difficult to find a calm center when you talk about um, uh, terrorism or terrorism policy. But um, nonetheless, it's an area where there, the one thing we know is that we built up a, a huge and opaque national security state. And uh, there, are, there are a lot of assumptions inside that that system that haven't really been questioned or examined even by Congress for most of the last 10 years. I don't know what the answers are, but I do think there's work to do as a reporter. And so what do you think of the positioning of U.S. media organizations to cover these issues? Do we have the right perspective, yeah. the right resources? Yeah, there are very few institutions now compared to, say, the 1990s that have the professional cadre of experienced reporters who have the eyesight and the, the sources and the um, education and the um, persistence, and but mostly also the institutional backing and the support to go out and work on these subjects every day. So the New York Times is still there, and the New York Times is now what we've got basically in this space. And But we used to always feel at the Washington Post when our newsroom was 800 strong, and of course it's now you know probably five-eighths of that number. It's still a formidable newsroom, and it has some great reporters in it, but when we were 800 strong and the LA Times was 1,000 strong, um, we were always sort of aligned with the LA Times on the theory that, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But one of the public services that we've always felt that we performed, and we said it tongue-in-cheek, but I think it had some validity, was that somebody had to keep the New York Times honest. <laughs> you don't want a monopoly of national security reporting in this country. So uh, the the fact that there were two or three or four, the Wall Street Journal was another, still has capacity, probably more than the Post and the LA Times today. But that there were four or five or six of these organizations and network news operations with some pretty good investigative reporters, you know, they, there was a, a healthy marketplace of angles of reporting and interpretation and discovery that I think um, served the public better than having just one big last man standing uh, newspaper organization, as fine as the Times work uh, is, um, you know, it, it could use some, some competition. Well, that's actually a fantastic segue into my, my last question, talking about American journalism more broadly. Uh, did this line that I found really fascinating in the interview you did with the Columbia Journalism Review on uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, purchase of the Post, where he said, it's very difficult to build a great newsroom when you overemphasize the data science of, of consumer preferences. Right. And what I, what I took from that, the main question is, isn't that what newspapers have all, always done in some form? And aren't consumer preferences on some level what drive our sense of what is newsworthy? 
Yes, but the, in the period of the professionalization of the newspaper industry and of the profession of journalism um, in these big newsrooms, you know, there was a, let's call it from the end of the Second World War roughly through until, you know, 2006 or so. Uh, journalism rose as a profession with an independent sense of um, purpose in the public square not solely because of the market imperative of delivering a certain kind of news to consumer preferences. It was an accident of history that journalism arose as a profession in this way. Partly it was the rise of scientific method, partly as a, as a mechanism for social science and for, and for professions in general, evidence-based work was all over the place. Uh, partly it was the rise of professions, accounting, law, medicine, the sense of peer-reviewed standards, excellence. Journalism wanted to become a fully formed profession comparable to law, medicine, accounting. And all of that was possible because of this long period of economic stability in newspaper business models. Newspapers became quasi-monopolies once the evening papers started to die. There was really only one great paper in every city for about 20 years. That was happened to coincide with my life in the Washington Post newsroom. And uh, so more like the BBC or other quasi-monopolistic news organizations, you had the space to actually think as a profession, peer-reviewed and, you know, with readers relevant to your equation, but you also had to think about whether you had a public interest mission that was larger than consumer preferences. And, the, and the, the sense of the profession after Watergate was, yes, we do, we, we, we must. And many readers rewarded that profession. Some thought that it was irrelevant to their lives, but nobody was market testing the proposition because these were monopolies. <laughs> you, could have pub you could have chosen just to print the color blue every day because uh, as long as you deliver the same advertising market penetration, you would have thought that that was the consumer preference. So uh, that was a kind of um, accident. And what has happened as the great disruption has occurred is that that whole proposition has been exposed as something other than the natural product of market forces. It was, it was, the, it was an, an imposed by a profession with a public interest argument attached to it. And a lot of people now are saying, well, uh, we still believe in the public interest mission, but we'll have to find nonprofits or universities or other places to do that work. And other people say, you know, it was all just a scam. It was just a bunch of self-rewarding journalists doing big vanity projects. And after all, they missed the fact that Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction. And so they're, they're the lamestream media. So we, we haven't finished with that argument, but it, it is kind of what I think the story is about. Steve Cole, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Appreciate it.